Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, a very warm welcome to all of you. I think we are all excited, not just to see John Gray, but to be able to be back to a lot of uh, physical interaction, uh, seeing old friends and new friends. Uh, so uh, I, a very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, distinguished speaker series organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Finance. Um, for me, I'm Howard Lee, one of the Deputy Chief Executive of HAMA. I'm the moderator uh, for today. Now, before I introduce our guests, uh, a little bit of housekeeping uh, first. Our seminar today will be in hybrid form. Uh, we have around 60 uh, attendees uh, in this hall. Uh, but on top of that, we have 1,200 uh, registrants uh, uh, viewing this event online. And the seminar will also be recorded and uploaded into the Academy's YouTube channel afterwards. Now, uh, we, we would have some chit chats first, and then at the end of it, we have around 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. Uh, so uh, uh, all of you can uh, raise your hand and ask questions. And for online audience, uh, you might also type in questions uh, through your uh, Q&A boxes. Now, first of all, let me introduce our distinguished speaker today. Uh, John Gray. Uh, John is widely recognized as a Wall Street's uh, top investor in real estate. He's now the president and COO of Blackstone, uh, the world's leading alternative investment manager. Now, I, I was too uh, reminded that John was named in Fortune's uh, 40 Under 40 in 2009. That was a long time that, ago. That was, that was, that was a while ago, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. still, uh, you can work out for by yourself, how young I, he still I is. I just had uh, my 53rd Given where he is. <laughs> so, uh, so before we start, let, let's give a warm applause uh, to, to John. Well, John, the, um, thank you. Uh, we, we met a couple of months ago in New York, uh, um, and it's very good to see you here in Hong Kong. Um, now, before I go into the very uh, technical question, and I understand this is your first time in Hong Kong for quite a few years. So tell me uh, what you saw and how you feel. Anything surprised you? Uh, well, but... I would say uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be back. Um, I think everybody uh, knows that COVID has been an incredibly difficult period in so many different ways. But just at a human level, to not be able to see people, particularly your friends, for a long period of time, it's difficult, and so to be able to get back here feels really good. I was supposed to be here a few months ago and got COVID, uh, but it was terrific. I it was just in the office. We did a town hall with our people here, and it was great to see them. I had a dinner with our partners last night. Um, there's nothing like being together, and I would say, um, what's the surprising thing? I guess that things feel like they were before. I mean, you walk on the street, people are out, the shops are busy. Um, everybody's still wearing masks. That feels like it's going away soon. But otherwise, it feels pretty similar. And uh, again, it's just nice to be back here, to be with people, and to connect in person. Yeah, very good, very good. And um, I hope uh, we will see you more in Hong Kong going forward now that uh, the world, including Hong Kong and the mainland China, uh, is really uh, fully open. So uh, with that, uh, let's move on to, uh, into a discussion of more financial issues. Now, of course, one big issue everybody think about and talk about uh, is interest rate. Uh, the Fed has uh, given their guidance, and uh, Jay Powell sort of um, talk about uh, ongoing increases uh, in the target range. Uh, so um, everybody has its own guess about the rate, and we read the same in the newspaper. But you are in a vantage point in the sense that you can see a lot of real activity in the real sector, in your assets, in your companies. So what's your take about the interest rate and also how is it impacting on the real economy? Do you feel that uh, America is still going strong and do you see the probability of recession going up or going down? Can you share some of your sure. unique perspective? So maybe I'll step back, because um, I think it's helpful to have perspective on what's happened. If, if you look at the post-COVID period, I think about it in sort of three chapters. The first was the boom period we experienced, which was the middle of 20, 
uh, through the end of 21, where monetary and fiscal policy were very accommodative. We had um, individuals who had a lot of pent up savings, and people went out, they were spending, um, asset prices went up a lot, economic activity was quite good, but inflation showed up, which was something we were very aware of at Blackstone given the scale of what we own. The second chapter here would be last year, where we saw the Fed and then other central banks follow move aggressively to raise the cost of capital, uh, now from zero to four and three quarters percent. And what we've seen is um, it impact interest rate sensitive assets. So stocks and bonds, which we all know too well, got impacted for sale housing, some capital goods areas. But to your question, Howard, we've still seen remarkable economic strength. In the fourth quarter in our, our private equity portfolio, and it's a little skewed because we have a lot of exposure to travel and leisure and energy and energy transition, but we said publicly revenues were up 14% in our portfolio. Mm. And it reflects an economy, I think, that is stronger than most people realize. There was a lot of gas in the tank. Mm. On the inflation side, we have begun to see a moderation. So there we've seen labor costs um, have come down from, call it 7 to 5.8, but still well above the Fed's target. Shipping costs are coming down. Commodity costs are coming down. So it is, um, we passed sort of peak inflation, which is obviously a positive. But as we move now to the third chapter, which is the current year, I think the challenge is it's easier to go from 8 to 4% inflation it's harder to get it down, and there's still a lot of economic momentum, particularly in the United States, to your point. And I think what the Fed is likely to do here is take rates up to five and a quarter, five and a half percent, and then hold it there for an extended period of time. I think the market 60 days ago, 30 days ago, was too optimistic that the economy was weakening more rapidly than it actually is. So, from our vantage point, the economy is still good, but it's sequentially slowing. Things like construction are slowing the most. Companies are becoming more hesitant in their hiring and their capital investment, and that will manifest itself over time. Policy works with a lag. And so what I think we'll see is this continued sequential slowdown. Policy stays tight. I think the Fed is very focused on what happened in the 1970s where they cut rates too soon and inflation got stickier and stickier. Mm. So my expectation, our expectation is we're going to have an inverted yield curve for this year. We're going to see higher short rates held for a while and economic activity slow, which will impact corporate earnings. Now, on the positive side, one, I do think we're beginning to see inflation slow, which is certainly positive, particularly for asset values. And two, when I think about this slowdown, we're in a much better spot than we were back in 08, 09. There, around the world, we had housing bubbles, we had commercial real estate bubbles, we had financial institutions that were too leveraged. And that led to a debt cycle, a very negative domino. I don't think we have that. Mm -hmm. It feels to me more like what we experienced in the early 2000 period where we had technology stocks that had run up too much. We had a Fed-induced slowdown. It ended up being shallow, um, and then we came out of it. And that feels more like what we're going to experience. But I think as investors, you want to anticipate slower economic times going forward and tighter Fed policy, but not something nearly as tough as what we experienced back in 08, 09. OK, very good. So assuming what you forecast is going to, uh, to be correct. And uh, so what does it mean to the different the investment and opportunity set in the different thematic areas, especially for those that you, Blackstone is good at, like uh, real estate, private equities, hedge, uh, hedge fund. And so, so do, do they, would they fare differently under this scenario? Or how do we position ourselves yeah. to capture these opportunities? The way we think about it is, um, if you think about asset values, there are two things that drive them higher. One is cash flows can grow in a business or an asset. Secondly, multiples can expand. If you buy into what I described and you have higher cost of capital, that's not an environment where you're going to see multiple expansion. 
And so it's almost like you have a plane with two engines, and one of them isn't going to be you know, giving you a lot of uh, forward momentum. And so you need to rely on that second engine. You've got to rely on cash flow growth. Mm. And that is how we're thinking about investing. We need things where cash flows will grow. So if you went through the various asset classes, in private credit, under my worldview, you would lean towards floating rate because the Fed's going to be restrictive. And as the Fed and other central banks raise rates, you get higher returns. Plus, I do that in the private market where the spreads are historically wide. Um, in real estate and hard assets, the good news is there's going to be less construction. But again, you want to focus on shorter duration assets with good fundamentals. So logistics has been a huge area of focus for us. We continue to do that. We're the biggest investor in the space. Rental housing, again, short duration, good underlying fundamentals because of the shortage there, as opposed to for sale housing, which is going to be under pressure because of higher rates. In the corporate area, I would look for sectors, what we call good neighborhoods, where there are secular tailwinds. So if you think about the digitalization of our lives, um, you think about life sciences, you think about the energy transition, green energy, travel, which has been a huge boom. It's one of the areas here we're particularly excited about. The alternative space, which we focus in, um, I think will do well. What we're trying to do is produce above inflationary, above cost of capital, cash flow growth to get real value growth. Mm. And, and whereas if you look back over the last 30, 40 years, basically any fixed stream of income was fine because you kept seeing rates come down and multiples expand. Today, I think I'd really lean on faster cash flow growth businesses and assets. Mm, very good. Now, let me also zero in a particular space with a private, a private credit. Uh, because in the last few years, this is a big area. And uh, some people even say that you, you are taking the, the, the cake of the banks. We have a lot of bankers here. So what's your take of it? Uh, uh, should we worry about this private credit, which is kind of unregulated, um, sort of going into some kind of um, uh, concern that regulators and central banks should worry about? I don't believe so. I think what's actually happening is quite positive for the financial system. It's, it's mostly a US phenomena. Uh, there's a bit of it in Europe as well, and, and smaller amount here in Asia. But if you step back, if you think about it, a financial institution is typically 12 to 15 times leveraged. They have one balance sheet. Um, they tend to have um, you know, guarantees from the central banks and the taxpayers. Uh, because they're deposit-taking institutions. And they're in, oftentimes, what I think of as the moving business, particularly for non-investment grade credit, where they're going to make a loan, they're going to get paid, and then they're going to sell it down. If you think about um, a non-traded uh, BDC or an SMA we have with an institutional investor in private credit, or us managing money for an insurance company. We're generally doing that on an unleveraged basis or maybe one times leverage as we are in our BDCs versus that 12 to 15. We're in the storage business versus the moving business. So essentially, we're making a loan to a private equity mm -hmm. sponsor or it could be infrastructure, real estate, whatever it is, and we're holding that loan. And if these vehicles we have make bad loans, the risk is to the investors. There's no systemic risk here. So when I think about distributing risk, I think this is really powerful. And it's one of the reasons, as you know, Europe has a very concentrated banking system. I think one of the great strengths of the US is we have a banking system, a capital market system, and then a robust private capital system. And so I think this is exactly the way you want to distribute risk. Mm. Um, and so I think it's a positive. And I think too often people think about something that's not acusive, not liquid, as having more risk. Yeah. That, to me, isn't the key determinant of risk if you are a long-term holder. So if you're an insurance company in the hold and maturity business, the idea that you can make a loan directly with the help of somebody like us, and you want to hold that loan, I don't think that introduces more risk. 
and that insurance company can hold on to more of the net economics. So I see this as a very healthy development. You know, people have been talking about it in the press for some time, and you haven't seen big problems in the private credit system. I would anticipate you won't again, even in this economically more challenged period. Well, so what you are suggesting, private credit actually contribute to financial stability and that you reduce the maturity transformation, reduce the liquidity, yeah, I mean, reduce the liquidity transformation. Right? That's what I think. If, if, if you think about what happens when the music stops, we certainly saw this in 08, 09, but if you, you even hear, there were a bunch of leveraged loans that were caught on banks' balance sheets. They have to take significant losses. Even if the credit itself is fine, spreads widen. Whereas if you're a non-traded BDC, you made that loan and you held it, there's no risk to the system. So I actually see it as healthy. The banks are always going to have a major role. I view this as complementary to the banking system and another way to distribute risk. I see, I see. OK, um, another trend that uh, we noticed in the last few years is that uh, private equity and alternative space has gone into more individuals and wealthy investors. Um, there are a lot of evolution of the sort of alternative space as well over the year. You, with your experience for such a long term, long time in the biggest alternative investment manager, can you generally talk about a little bit about the evolution uh, in terms of asset, in terms of um, the investor base and um, share with us? Well, you know, I've been doing this now, it's my 31st year, and, and I would say the alternatives business was a pretty narrow business even as recently as a decade ago. Um, we were primarily in three activities, which was private equity, real estate private equity, and I'll call it distressed or opportunistic credit. You were just trying to get you know, pretty high returns, in many cases 20 gross, 15 net for your customers, and you had a relatively small number of customers, mostly pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and a very small number of very wealthy individuals. The period of low rates, I think, got other investors to start to look at the alternative space, particularly because we produced higher returns. And what's evolved, and we've really been leading this, is an expansion of where we invest capital and who we do it for. So what do I mean by that? You know, you've seen growth in things like core plus real estate, oftentimes in open-ended vehicles or perpetual vehicles. Infrastructure, another long duration, lower returning asset class, but we think very defensive in its nature. Um, direct lending, part of the private credit universe. And then alternative fixed income, which we think of for these insurance clients. And at the same time, the client base has expanded a lot. Many more institutions around the world, um, insurance companies, and individual investors mm. who today historically have very low percentage, call it 1% versus 25 or 30 for institutional investors. And so when you think about the alternatives business, by the way, we still do our drawdown funds. We said we're raising $150 billion. On our last earnings call, we said we're raising $100 billion. We continue to do that for many clients around the world. But we're also doing these other activities. Um, and if you think about the investable universe sort of as a pyramid, at the very top are those highest returning strategies, but it's a more limited universe. As you start going into these lower returning strategies, it's a bigger universe. Mm. And so I think you will continue to see alternative firms grow. What we've seen in this downturn, again, the same questions that happened in 08, 09, will the alternative firms, are they going to go away and so forth? I think as long as we continue to deliver premium returns for that trade-off of liquidity, then capital will continue to come our way. And what you see in the asset management business is this really interesting bifurcation. It reminds me of the retail space, where in retail you have you know, sort of the discounters, which analogous, let's call it the ETFs or the index funds. And then you have the very high-end retail, you know, the fancy shops out there on Bond Street or Fifth Avenue, who of course have done very well. The equivalent thing would be in the alternative space, the returns that have been consistently stronger and clients have been willing to pay more fees because the net returns have produced, that have been produced have been higher. 
And so my view, if you look at alternatives, you know, when I joined Blackstone, we managed less than a billion dollars, and today we're just on the cusp of a trillion. I think the growth will continue to exceed people's expectations because of this broadening of who we serve and where we invest capital. Well, uh, of course, uh, the space of private equities or alternative has grown tremendously over the years. I have read the report that now alternative space in terms of management fee has actually exceeded the management fee collected by the public market managers. Uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> well, I would just... It's an interesting <laughs> question. What I would say on that is if you look at alternatives overall, it's a $10 trillion industry, which sounds big. We're about 10% of it. Um, but if you look at stocks and bonds, it's over 200 trillion. If you add in commercial real estate and infrastructure, you get to a very big number. So I still think of it as relatively small, but it does charge more, as well, you know. Well, AUM, a lot of passive fund, they are charging peanuts, and, yes. uh, but you, you have a pretty handsome fee. But, that, <laughs> but the key for us on that is we have to deliver for the customers. I, I, I say that we have an incredibly simple business model. We have to generate strong returns, and that's the only way our customers will allocate more capital. It's a bit like running a restaurant. If you serve good food, the customer comes back, orders more, and tries different things on the menu. And if we stop serving good food, if we become an AUM gatherer, then very sophisticated customers are gonna say, hey, I'm not having a good experience. So the onus is on us to constantly be innovating, evaluating what's happening in the world, seeing what we do, and translating that into premium investment results. If we don't do that, then we won't be able to grow and continue to charge what we do. Okay, very good. Now, of course, uh, an interview with you uh, I cannot end without going into deeper dive into real estate. Uh, so um, real estate uh, in a rising interest rate environment uh, usually suffers. And um, also uh, in the last few years, especially like uh, in Manhattan, commercial real estate has been really been the, really uh, in, a, in a down market. Uh, so uh, are we all putting our best into newer real estate like logistics like you described before? Or do you still see pockets of opportunity in different areas, in different geography? How do you see the differences uh, between different types of real estate and in different geography? Well, I'd start where you did, which is when you have higher interest rates, that raises the cost of capital for real estate, just like it does for companies. In real estate, you describe it as cap rates, the inverse of multiples. And those cap rates have to go higher to reflect the higher cost of capital. Mm. And that hits every piece of real estate. And so we're in the process now, we're seeing in the market these cap rates getting reset around the globe. And mm. it's the US, it's Europe, it's Asia. But then when you go beneath that, I would say the trends are very differentiated. So you mentioned office buildings. Um, that is a sector that faces enormous headwinds. In our business at Blackstone, US traditional office buildings 15 years ago were 45% of our portfolio. Today, US traditional office buildings are 2%. We've made a huge pivot away because we were not seeing rental growth that was keeping up with the capital costs and expenses, and we were worried about obsolescence. COVID has obviously created a new headwind with work from home, um, and now we face a more challenging hiring environment. So I think the office sector is one that faces not just the higher rate challenge, but fundamental challenges. And that's been a similar dynamic, and I would say that's true more so in the US, a little less so in Europe, and maybe even less so in Asia, where, where people are, I think, more likely to go to the office. Um, the retail sector's gone through a similar dynamic. You know, it's funny, if you went back, again, 10 or 15 years ago, shopping malls and closed malls and fancy office towers, those would have been the cool kids, right? And those are the sectors now, particularly in the US and Europe, that are facing the greatest headwinds. And um, the mall sector has gone through a re-rating process where their multiples came down, cap rates went up. Um, but that's a sector, again, because of the e-commerce shift that won't grow as fast as it did historically. On the other side of the ledger, as I mentioned, what we're seeing in the logistics is extraordinary. 
I mean, we're, we're seeing this share shift to e-commerce. We're seeing companies who are focused on redundancy given supply chain challenges. And we've bought $200 billion of warehouses in pretty much every major market in the world. And rents in place, in many cases, are 50% below the market, and the market's still growing at double digits. So that's a sector where once you change the cap rates, you'll continue to see very strong growth. Rental housing, similarly, um, because of the shortage in housing in developed markets, um, obviously a different story in this part of the world, but we haven't built enough housing in most developed markets since the financial crisis. And what that means is you still have upward pressure, and now we're going to see less building as a result of the increase of cost of capital. So that would be strong. And then some of the specialty sectors have very good tailwinds. Um, life science office buildings, because of what's happening in that space. Um, studios, because of the content creation that's happening. And then I would say the hotels. I'm particularly bullish on the hotels, mm -hmm. because travel is something people really want to consume. Um, and we're seeing real pricing power come back into that business, and again, less construction. So I would say, in general, markets tend to say real estate's bad. Mm. And our job is to identify what's actually happening. I think office buildings, very tough. For sale housing, very tough. Um, rental housing logistics, much better. And I think if you're in the right sectors, after this and a bunch of this multiple changes happen, I still think you'll see pretty good dynamics because underlying what really drives value, supply and demand, we're gonna see less building of commercial real estate even in the better sectors. Hmm. So we're looking to deploy capital in the sectors we like even as the headlines out there will be pretty negative and I think you'll see, I think you'll see a real distress act um, you know, dynamic in U.S. office buildings over the next year, year or two in particular. Yeah, yeah, well, when you talk about a portfolio, your size, you look about sort of a reallocation of an asset, of course, you, you still see price spots here and there. But what's your advice to those asset owners who are sitting on the stock of a core, core plus asset and anything they can do? Yes. Uh, you, you manage a lot of yes. things as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think my advice would be to be sober about what's going on. You know, we, we have marked down using office buildings as an example pretty significantly our office buildings to reflect this changed world. And I think if you do that, you can then say, okay, from here, where are there better prospects? And I think as human beings, we have a bias to sell our winners and to hold on to our losers because it feels badly to lose money. Even though you made that decision seven years ago, what you really should say is, I have $100 in each of these at the current market value. What's gonna grow faster? Now you may conclude that today, because debt costs are elevated and people are not transacting, I don't really wanna sell much of anything because I can't get a fair price. But my thought process would be, soberly look at what the prospects are going forward and based on that, deploy capital. And if you've got to take the pain and sell, take the pain. Mark the assets to reflect the current market and move on. And I think the mistake we often make is we stick with something even though we know it's tough because we don't want to acknowledge we've made a mistake. And we try at Blackstone to be truth tellers to ourselves. We don't always get it right. But if you do that, then you hopefully will hold on to those things that can compound at higher rates. Oh, that's a very good advice. Uh, investment is investing in the future prospect. So anything happened in the past? Well, you made that mistake. And look, I, I talk about how we pivoted so much to logistics and rental housing or in private equity to energy, energy transition, travel. But we've made mistakes too. And we sit around and say, OK, we made that mistake you know, mark the asset to its current value. Maybe even from here, it's not gonna grow a lot. Maybe it's okay to exit that. We accept that. Because the key is we wanna drive returns going forward. Okay, very good. Now, uh, maybe we change the subject a little bit into something I'm sure everyone in the room uh, feel uh, some, uh, some pain about, is talent. Uh, of course, you, uh, you talk about, you charge a 
better fee because of the value you offer, and that depends on the value created by your team, your talent. So, um, what's your secret of getting the best talent? Um, of course, paying them well is something. Yeah. Um, but um, but um, any anything that you can share that you can develop the culture, the cohesion, and um, everything. I think it's the most important thing. If you, if you think about an investment business, we don't have the secret formula to Coca-Cola, right? We just have these immensely talented people who have been well-trained, um, who work together to produce great outcomes. And so you want to create an environment where they want to be there. Compensation's part of it, but people don't just come to work no matter how much they make just for the money. And a great organization creates a culture that keeps people. And I think you know, Steve Schwarzman gets enormous credit for creating a real sense of meritocracy at Blackstone. That no matter what level you come in, you have the opportunity to rise up to the top. And so if you create that kind of organization where you allow people to develop professionally, I think that's hugely valuable. I, I also think you know, having people feel connected with a shared sense of mission. Like, our job is to deliver for our clients and at the same time, try to be a force for good, have a positive impact, create jobs, improve communities, um, you know, decarbonize, obviously, through a fiduciary, fiduciary lens, try to create more in terms of diversity of opportunity uh, for all sorts of people. So if people understand that clear mission and they buy into it, I think that's great. And then we've tried to use all sorts of tools to stay connected. So every Monday we have something called Blackstone TV, which is an internal Zoom call. Um, <laughs> but we call it TV because it sounds cooler. And you know, we talk about what we're seeing in the world, celebrate our successes, um, talk about the investment environment, uh, we have a photo contest every week. Last week, it was pictures with your dogs. Um, we show people <laughs> climbing mountains and running marathons, overcoming cancer. We want them to feel like they're connected. They're an analyst in Tokyo or London or wherever they are. They feel connected. Um, we've been big believers in bringing people back to the office because we think that that's how you build. Ah, there you go. Somebody's listening here. Um, <laughs> We, we're big believers in bringing people back because that's how you train them, that's how you connect people, um, which is different than most companies. Since really the middle of 20, we've been uh, full-time in the office for our investment professionals five days a week. And so I want to make sure that the people who come to our place to work really enjoy what they do. And so they will stay because there's a lot of learned knowledge that you, that you, as you train people. And it is a team sport, raising the money, financing the transactions, underwriting them, portfolio operations, all the people in finance and investor relations, you want them to feel connected. And so I'm passionate about trying to build the best culture possible, because I think we'll build the best firm. And, and what excites me is this year we had 30,000 young people apply for 200 analyst jobs. Wow. And I can just say I'm very lucky I got a job in 1992. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> so I, I think this is, I think it's hugely important. And I think sometimes companies underrate the importance of it. And I think in this environment where a lot of companies, for cost reasons or other, have moved to exclusive work from home or two days in the office, I think it's very hard to hold on to the culture. And so for us, this is the dynamic we want to keep. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you. Um, but. You, you also mentioned kind of a work from home uh, now that you bring all the people back to the office. But in the last two, three years, I'm sure, there's a, an extended period where a lot of people sort of were working from home. But that was also a time where you faced a lot of challenges in the portfolio company, in fundraising, and a lot of things. So how, how did you manage that period with a lot of people sort of not in the office and any? Any, any, any secret uh, You know, during that very difficult period in March of 20, where all of us went home around the globe, 
you know, we were doing daily calls with all the senior leaders at the firm talking about what we were seeing. I mean, we had never envisioned a scenario where we would have major businesses that had no revenue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's pretty mind boggling there. And you have debt service and you have employees and how you're managing this. Plus you're focused on the health and safety of your people mm -hmm. and your portfolio company employees. So as the pandemic went on, I think we just developed cadence. I mean, obviously Zoom, and those tools became really important. And we, the frequency of meetings, um, you know, was very powerful in keeping people connected. Our, our Monday BX TV, our regular management committee, operating committee, we just tried to stay as connected as possible so that as the world changed, we could share information, what we're seeing on the ground in different places around the world. And it was pretty seamless. But it definitely helped to be together. It helped to be together. There's no question that that, I think, was a competitive advantage for us. And it, I really do think of investing as pattern recognition, that you see a bunch of dots, you connect them, and you act on that. And so I'm trying to, we're trying to, through data science, um, through being connected around the globe, now through being back out and traveling, sharing information, and then trying to act on it and identifying some of these themes we talked about, being a high conviction investor. So the other thing I would just say is, it's really important to stay calm. Yeah. I say to our people every week at the end of BXTV, stay calm, <laughs> stay positive, never give up. And I think as an investor, it's easy to be highs and lows, the market's up 1,000, it's down 3,000, the bond market, you know, the CPI's super high, it's low. You want to take a long-term perspective, and you want to be calm and make the best decisions. Now, it does mean you, you do have crises, so you do have to jump on those. But you need a really balanced and thoughtful approach. And that, to me, was another reminder in this kind of environment. And as an investor, of course, it's even more important because sometimes the very best opportunities emerge at the times of greatest dislocation. And you have to, at the same time you're dealing with a crisis over here, an opportunity could be emerging, and you can't be afraid to deploy your dry powder. And so I think being a dedicated investment firm, it's built into our DNA, but we have to remind ourselves also to, to in these moments, be looking for new opportunities. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, before we move to Q&A, let me turn to something a little bit more personal. Um, I explained to you what's the background for the Academy of Finance. Of course, one of the key functions is provide the kind of uh, network, perspective, exposure to leaders and uh, prospective leaders uh, of the Hong Kong financial sector. So um, you are, of course, a very successful um, um, uh, uh, financial leader um, in the global uh, context. So I would like to ask a little bit about what do you think your secret of success? Now, before as you ask the, answer the question, I tell you a little bit of secret, uh, in the sense that you remember last fall I was in New York and I was talking to Steve Swassman, then you very kindly dropped by. And when you left, and Steve spent two, three minutes and talk about how good you were. And, uh, and, uh, so, I love uh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and said, you terrific on top of everything. So I'm sure you are very good. So tell me, how, good, how can you be so good? Well, <laughs> I'm not good at self-reflection. I'd start there. Um, look, I'd start with I was incredibly fortunate to land at a place straight out of college that um, really encouraged me. I fell in love with the investing business. Um, as I talked about earlier, the place is a real meritocracy. Um, I, I often say luck is sort of a core competency for me. Um, you know, I spent a year doing private equity and M&A, and then the real estate business in the early 90s was upside down, and Pete Peterson and Steve Schwarzman said, hey, we should go into this. They found a guy in Chicago named John Schreiber, terrific human being, who said uh, they, who didn't have any junior people. And I was asked to join that. And I got to grow up with the business and really learn from the ground up 
uh, the real estate business, which I fell in love with. And then over the course of my career, you know, I got to watch and help lead as we pushed our business from the US, just as an equity investor to Europe and Asia, into credit, senior credit, junior credit, you know, opportunistic real estate, core plus, all sorts of things in the public markets, capital markets. Um, and then the firm, Steve, my predecessor in this position, Tony James, you know, identified really more than a decade ago, sort of telling me, hey, you're gonna get more responsibility. You need to build up your team. Putting me on the management committee 15 years ago and on the board 11 years ago, all of these things, I got this amazing training. And, you know, what's my secret? I love what I do. I love the investing business. I love the intellectual challenge of it. I love the people I get to meet. Um, I get the places, I love the places I get to see. I love the team nature of it. It does remind me of sports. You know, I really feel like we're working as a team to get to the right outcomes. Um, and, and I think for me, I've always enjoyed being sort of high conviction that if I believe in something, I really want to lean in all the way. And I think as an investor, that's how you produce differentiated returns. And then in just on the people side, I think the fact that I like people, working with people, it makes it easier to be a manager and leader because you genuinely want to be with other people. You want to see them succeed. And then I would say, I think I was very lucky. Not only did I get a job out of college, but I met my wife. And she and my four daughters have been amazingly valuable in providing balance to me that you know, when you're going through 08, 09, or March of 20, or whatever it is, just providing balance so you, don't, so you, you sort of know there's something else that really matters in your life. And even when things are bad at the office, you know, there's something else that's obviously super important and people who really care about you. And uh, by the way, I got a COVID dog. That turned out to be really helpful. But um, I, I think the combination of sort of a passion for what I've done and having gone to a place that really allowed me to flourish mm -hmm. and that is constantly growing and pushing in different asset class geographies, all that's been very fortunate. And so um, I just feel incredibly blessed. I mean, I, I, I feel sometimes using a US analogy that from an investment standpoint, I get to play shortstop at Yankee Stadium. I mean, you get to see all these big challenges and think about how do I maximize returns? How do I think about what's happening in life sciences, this massive energy transition that's underway? So um, I just really enjoy it. And I think at its heart, that's helped me be successful. Well, from what I hear, it, everything starts from love. Love what yes. you do and love all the people around Good around you. Valentine's Day. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was in Mumbai on Valentine's Day, which was not perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, maybe let's turn to uh, Q&A. Uh, uh, we can uh, have uh, maybe 15, 16 uh, minutes for Q&A. Uh, so uh, we can open to the floor. So if anyone would like to ask you a question, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, we, we have colleagues passing you a microphone. Uh, if uh, you are online, you also can uh, ask your questions through the Q&A box. So, uh, anyone? Uh, okay, I see uh, John Tang uh, from Standard Charter Bank. Hey, hi John. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, very uh, inspiring uh, sharing. Uh, I have a question on the geographic allocation. Given the uh, uh, very high funding cost, and that is also going to stay for quite a long time, as you said, um, the, it's getting more and more challenging to, to beat the uh, expected return of the investors. So from a geographical allocation perspective, do you think uh, Blackwall, uh, Blackstone, as well as the other investment uh, investors, will start to shift some of the investment into emerging markets? Thank you. Well, I think you, back to the earlier comments, um, your question spot on. You need higher growth in whatever you invest in because we're not going to be relying on that multiple expansion. Um, I think the emerging markets do create opportunities for higher growth. As I said, I was in India earlier this week, and the growth there is very strong. We've been quite active. 
Um, I think there will be other emerging markets that create opportunity in this part of the world, certainly. Um, you know, places like Mexico and Vietnam also. Um, I, I think in general, um, trying to find higher growth makes a lot of sense. The countervailing force is that in some of these places, rule of law, liquidity, financing are very tough to come by. And we've had some mixed experiences in some places um, you know, where it's been more challenging to deploy because you know, change of government happens and the rules change, or we've seen currencies decline a lot. And in private investing, unlike public markets, liquidity really matters, right? So if you, you know, getting out of a large asset in a smaller emerging market country is tougher. Um, so I, I would say certain sectors are better. Digital infrastructure, you know, think about data centers and towers, which are often priced in dollars with CPI bumps. Um, I think that can be, those can be compelling. And I would say just generally in emerging markets, I think Asia and Southeast Asia are probably the best positioned, just given the age of the populations and some of the growth potential in the manufacturing space. And the governments tend to be more favorable towards capital and growth than in some of the other parts of the world where um, they, they not necessarily treat capital as well. Without going into specifics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we, 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 I just say we've, we've had a, you know, if you, you, maybe I'd just say like if you look in Latin America, it's been harder because there's been this, um, in many cases, shift to governments who are less favorable to foreign capital, and that makes it harder for us. That, that, that makes sense. OK, uh, so the gentleman at the back. Hi, I'm Jonathan from the British Consulate General here. Um, touching on the end of your last question, how do you think about and frame geopolitical risk, particularly as, and think about issues such as sanctions, export controls, and governments that have uh, tighter investment screening and increasing new regulations? Thank you. Well, it's a real issue for us. Um, I think it's an issue for everybody uh, because you have to factor this in if you're investing. There are sectors that are increasingly scrutinized uh, on both sides, um, outbound and inbound. And therefore, I think in some of the most sensitive technology and data sectors, it can be more difficult to invest in some of these on a cross-border basis. I think safer... Um, you know, our, our domestic consumption-related businesses, you know, there's not a lot of concern if you invest in restaurants or hotels, entertainment, those sort of things. And so I would say, depending on the country around the world, it's certainly something that factors in. And um, it makes investing harder, and it means um, as these things arise, you have to become a little more selective. And I would say, obviously, technology is an area but there are other sensitive sectors in places around the world, not, not just in this part of the world, but you know, housing is a sensitive area in a lot of countries, education, um, healthcare. I, I think, and by the way, even in the US in some of these sectors, you know, regulatory footprint. So I would say the regulatory overlay for us as we think about deploying capital has grown quite a bit versus 10 or 20 years ago. Okay, thank you. I saw James also put up his hand. Yeah, uh, thanks, Howard. And John, thanks very much for being back in Hong Kong. James Houghton from Goldman Sachs. My question, uh, Howard, was actually very much related to the last gentleman's question around geopolitical risk, which is obviously changing the investing landscape. But maybe to frame it another way, you touched on decarbonization, you touched on climate change. If you think out for the next decade or so, of these two themes, climate change and geopolitical risk, which do you think is going to have a greater impact on Blackstone, both from a management company level, but also from the, at the operating company level? I, I would put climate change. I, I think ultimately governments are going to conclude that there'll be certain things that they're very sensitive about, but they're going to want cross-border investment. So I think the rules, there'll be a set of rules, and you'll know that these industries are more sensitive, but on all sides, I think they're going to want to encourage foreign investment. I could be wrong, but that would be my guess. So I think we'll see a shift. There'll be sense sectors that are more sensitive, 
but you'll be open for cross-border investment. I think the, the, the green energy revolution is profound. Whatever your political views are on this, this is happening. And so we've said publicly, we have $100 billion we think we can invest over the next decade across our energy debt, energy equity, and infrastructure business. And we're doing it through a fiduciary lens. One of the sensitive issues is you know, we're not running a philanthropy. We have to generate returns. But because this huge transition is happening, there's opportunities in creating new green energy, new wind, solar, all sorts of services, picks and shovels, compliance, consulting firms, carbon credit trading firms. Um, we see a huge universe around that. I think the, the hard part is today people in some cases are paying a real green premium. And you don't want to buy something that's you know, a bond-like asset that you know, some company, because of their green check the box, may pay above an economic return for. So I'm much more interested in creating these assets or servicing them, but we see an enormous opportunity. So when I think about our firm over the next decade, I think you'll see an enormous amount of investment because there's tons of infrastructure that has to come with it, right? I mean, we're really electrifying, right? We're gonna move to electrification of so much we do. So there has to be enormous spend associated with that. And we just have to find the sectors where you can get above sort of economic growth returns for doing that. I think that's pretty significant. And I see it everywhere. I mean, look at EV penetration. I mean, the UK, we just had the British consulate here, you know, has gone from low single digits into the 20s. I think EVs in China are 30 plus. Even the US has doubled the last couple of years. Um, I think this is gonna grow in a massive way. Um, I think the other thing that obviously will have a profound impact is AI and what that's going to mean for lots and lots of businesses. And that's an area we spend a ton of time on, data science and so forth. You cannot look at the world as a static place. You have to be, back to this comment, thinking forward about what's coming next, what's going to change. And just because something was some way in the past, it's not necessarily in the future. And I would put sort of this green energy revolution at the very top of the list and super capital intensive. So for a firm like us, lots and lots of opportunities all across the globe. Mm. Okay, maybe I take one more question from the floor and then I turn to the, uh, Pauline. Uh, sorry, hi, um, uh, welcome back, John. Um, uh, this should be an easy question. Um, private markets and public markets, uh, in a t time horizon of five to 10 years, what do you think, whether private markets will outperform public markets? You're asking the president of the largest private market investment firm in the world. <laughs> yeah. You said it was an easy question. So I, I continue to believe that we can outperform. And the reason I believe that is because of the huge scale we have because of what we do to assets and companies, meaning we're not passive owners. We buy a business. Um, I, as I mentioned, I was in India. There was a company called Sona Comstar, which is a traditional automotive parts business that had a small EV um, business, component parts business. And we put huge investment, made some acquisitions. This has turned out to be one of our most successful investments of all time because of what we did working with the management team there to really pivot their focus into the EV uh, growth that's out there. One in every eight EVs that's built now has a Sona Comstar, some parts in it. And so I think that ability to align management teams, to um, intervene in companies, to maximize the time to exit them, um, and also, I just think in general, there's an illiquidity premium. The interesting thing in public markets is if I want to buy a million dollars of stock in a company and you want to buy a billion, I've got the competitive advantage. But if I want to lend a small amount of money and you, you want to lend a large amount of money, you've got the competitive advantage. So because you know, if a company needs a billion dollars but can't access the public markets for whatever reason, being a private market just offers you greater returns because there are less participants. And if you look at the data at CalPERS or 
the Canadian pension plan, people have been at this for 30, 35 years. You see the consistent outperformance of private markets. I don't see that any reason that's going to change. Now, private markets are connected to public markets. So if, pr if public markets deliver 5 or 7%, there'll be a premium, but it's tied to that. But I think that premium is durable. And that's what we've been proving for a long time. And that's what I think will continue to happen. But it doesn't mean you don't have exposure. It just means in the context of an overall portfolio, having some portion allocated to private markets makes a lot of sense. We would obviously argue for a larger portion. Mm. OK, thank you very much, John. Now, I, I got a question uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the online uh, box. Uh, so John, you talk a lot about your uh, positive experience. But in your 30 years investment life, you must have come across some really bad experience in terms of investment. Can you share one of those and tell us what kind of lesson you have learned from that? Sure. Um, you, you know, what's funny as an investor is you remember your mistakes much better than your successes. And, and you tend not to study while you're, why you're successful. You're just like, I'm brilliant, right? <laughs> Even if it was just good you know, luck. Um, you know, I, I would mention a couple. Uh, I bought a bunch of uh, one-story office buildings in Northern California during the dot-com bubble in 1999. And um, we were paying a huge price in retrospect, probably triple the underlying building value. But I was so caught up in the enthusiasm and the rents the tenant was paying were so high. The name of the tenant was gobosh.com, which meant get big, go big or stay home.com. And I should have stayed home. And I lost sight of sort of fundamental value in the mania. And you know, there was obviously some of that uh, in 2020 and 2021 in the technology world again, where people were paying things 20, 30 times revenues without any thought of what profitability would be over time. And so when you have these experiences where you lose your sort of grounding, it it's, does a lot. I would also say, um, going back to the real estate era, I remember in 06, 07, we did no residential for the whole period of time, and then we were watching everyone making so much money, and we finally did one deal. And we did a very structured deal because we were worried about downside. And of course, then we had the huge housing wipeout in 08, 09. And you know, the lesson to me was you know, sort of stick to your convictions again. That was clearly a bubble in US housing. And I think the hardest thing is when the momentum gets going, be it as we saw in crypto or SPACs, or you know, technology companies, and everybody's making money, it's really hard to not jump on the train. And I think you just need to stick with your discipline. At the same time, the world is changing. And so to, to, just, to not acknowledge how things are changing, I think, is a mistake. But when I look back at the SPAC era, we didn't sponsor SPACs because I couldn't figure out if you charge 20% up front and you were buying companies who not necessarily may not want couldn't go public, you you could end up with adverse selection and a very heavy fee load, and I couldn't produce a better return for the customers. So, I again I think the lessons would be try not to get caught up in the mania. I would say on the flip side, my experience buying Hilton Worldwide just before the financial crisis, which at the time looked pretty stupid, um, there we bought an amazing business. And we ended up making $14 billion, even though at one point we'd written it down by 70% because we had a great business. Global travel was a mega trend. We had a terrific management team. And that, of course, has led me to the conclusion to try to find better businesses, better neighborhoods, and lean into that. Mm. And, and yes, you've got to keep your discipline um, as well. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, John. I, I think uh, I enjoy your uh, sharing immense, immensely. So I'm sure uh, all our colleagues uh, here and also online uh, uh, also uh, have the same feeling. Uh, so um, I'm not going to sum up what you talk about, but I just uh, got for myself one wisdom that you offer. It's about love. It's how to fall in love with your job, how to fall in love with your uh, people around you, 
but not to fall in love with bad investment that you made. By the way, <laughs> I, I think that's a perfect summary. I mean, I, I think what you've got to do is build your teams in life and then look dispassionately as you're making investments. But when you find something, a trend or a theme that you do really love, to lean into that. And you know, I'm thinking about this part of the world. My, my one trend that I would believe here that's coming is travel is going to explode. That the people from mainland China are going to come to Hong Kong and Macau very quickly, uh, very soon. I know they've begun. They're going to travel in the rest of the region. They're going to travel around the globe. And so if you can find one of these trends that you absolutely believe in, lean in, put your chips behind that, work with amazing people, and good things will happen. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you once again. Uh, let's all give a big hand to John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Howard. Thank you so much.